everyone, welcome to Connected. I am Fabiana Espinosa and I am ready to converse with Emily De Passe. I invited Emily because of her much needed work promoting inclusion and social justice. Sex education is still not talked about enough in different parts of the world. The speech used nowadays is outdated and needs to get more real. For instance, okay, Kids learn over and over how to use a condom to prevent sexual diseases. But what happens when you already contracted one? Or your son, daughter, mom, cousin did? How do you manage the situation, your life, your future relationships? We need to address these topics. There are more than 1 million sexually transmitted infections acquired every day worldwide. Thankfully, there are amazing professionals like Emily De Passe that dedicate their work to educate and redefine the narratives around STIs, sexuality, and the stigmas around them. Do not go anywhere, Connected starts right now. Emily De Passi is a Philadelphia-based writer and sexologist. Her purpose is to educate and redefine the narratives around STIs, sexuality, and the stigmas around them through her writing, academic research, and community events. When she publicly shared her story and herpes diagnosis in December 2015, Emily wanted to help just one person overcome the stigma. Nearly four years later, Emily is considered as a leading expert on dismantling STI stigma. Her work has been highlighted by Bradley, Dame, Elite Daily, Philly Current, Todd Catalog, and more. Emily's background is rooted in an interdisciplinary, trauma-informed approach to gender, sexuality, and social justice issues. She is currently pursuing her Master of Social Work and Master of Education in Human Sexuality Studies at Widner University Center for Human Sexuality Studies. It is my pleasure today to introduce Emily De Paz. She is talking to us all the way from Pennsylvania in the US. Emily, thank you so much for the time you are taking to be with us and actually for all the amazing work that you do on this topic that I think it's so important and much needed nowadays. Let's go ahead with the first question. Please tell us, how did your life lead you towards the path of sex education? That's a really interesting question because I, you know, most kids don't grow up wanting to be sex educators or even really knowing what that means. So when I entered college, I entered as an elementary education teacher. And to an extent, you know, I still educate uh, just a different population. So I entered as an elementary education major and I decided to get my general requirements out of the way. Uh, that way I can focus on my specialization in my junior and senior years. And so within a month, I quickly abandoned that idea after finding that I was interested in other courses on the um, listed on course requirements and thought that I'd explore a little bit. So after I declared my major as undecided, I then, uh, I think I made a psychology major for a little bit. And then on the psychology of the course book, it had classes like psychology of women and psychology of men and psychology of sex. So that's really how I got interested. Like, oh, wow, I can study these things. And so uh, I think it was in a history class and I started looking more thoroughly at just the entire university's course work. And I found that there was an actual major uh, that was gender and sexuality studies. And at this point, I didn't really want to be a sex educator or sex therapist. It was just kind of like, oh, this is really interesting. What can I do with this? And so I was in a sociology class and um, I learned that this was kind of a profession and that people did this. And I was like, I'm gonna do this. I was my sophomore year. 
of college when I decided that. So my original area of expertise was based on my own experience because I had an eating disorder in high school. So I was really interested in how uh, our perception of body image affects the mechanics of orgasm and our sexuality. So that was my initial research topic that I wanted to do. And uh, after I graduated, I began to apply to the university that I'm at now for graduate school, but with a different niche. And so now I'm studying with the intent and purpose of destigmatizing STIs, sexually transmitted infections and diseases. Exactly. And this is how, where my next qu question is going. What are they? What is it? And how common it is in the world? Sure. So STDs and STIs are infections, viruses, and uh, bacteria that are spread through intimate contact. I say intimate contact because they can be spread through other means as well, you know, kissing or just even a kiss on the cheek can uh, spread herpes, which people know commonly as genital herpes. But, um, you know, in younger children, they're more often known as cold sores. So I looked up some statistics for Bolivia, but I only got rid of the HIV AIDS information. Um, but in the U.S., I know that it's about 20 million cases are reported each year. But I also want to reiterate that, you know, this isn't really that's a lot of STIs that are reported, but it doesn't account for those that are undetected or for people that don't know they have them or for the people that are so afraid that they have an STI that they don't report it or go see a doctor and that they continue just kind of self-treating or sitting with that. Um, and I believe the statistic that I really like is that one in two young adults contract a sexually transmitted infection or disease by age 25. And that's half of the sexually active population but our society, and I'm not sure what Bolivia teaches, but we're taught, you know, just avoid these, you'll never get them, kind of that we're invincible. So it's kind of, no one learns that you can get an STI and that it's common to contract one or what to do if you get one. You just learn, don't do this, this is what it looks like. And that's the end of that conversation, typically. Right, that's exactly what I wanted to say because we, it's not that we are tired, but commonly we know that uh, sex education goes to, oh, this is how you use a condom, use it, mm -hmm. right? But then we go, yep. we, there is the need of going forward and speaking about what if I already have this or my son or right. my mother or because there is no age for this, even though we focus on on right. teenagers, this can happen to anyone. Mm -hmm. People also don't realize is that skin to skin infections like herpes can still be transmitted with a condom. Uh, um, and that's something that sex ed also doesn't usually teach you. Exactly. So you started having this conversation on a blog, writing a blog, correct? Tell mm -hmm. me how I was did. that experience? How did you say, okay, I'm going to use my own experience to connect with others and not only help them, but like uh, learn from them. How was that right. experience for you? So I was diagnosed short, it was about a month and a half after my undergraduate graduation. And I really kind of fell apart and became someone that I didn't know and was really stuck with who, who am I now that I have this thing and what does that mean for me? Uh, and it really took, I hate that it comes back to this, but it, it always comes back to the fact that this person uh, broke up with me before Christmas and it kind of caused me to reflect like, okay, well, where am I going with my life? Like, what am I doing? What have I been doing? And how am I gonna pick myself up from here? And I had been writing about this darkness on my blog, but I hadn't labeled it yet. And so after Christmas, it was like one of, it was like December 27th or 26th around there. Uh, I actually publicly disclosed on Facebook that I had an STI and how it affected me in my relationships um, and kind of just brought awareness because I had been sharing some articles, but I hadn't really told anyone except my close friends and family members why I was sharing so much about these STIs. And I said, you know what, like I, I just want to help one person. Um, and if my experience of me publicly disclosing this and using my knowledge and sexual health history to share this message and lift others up, um, that's something that's meaningful to me. And that's my work. And at this point, it wasn't really a purpose or a career purpose. Um, you know, I wrote for a few places like Thought Catalog and Elite Daily, and I started receiving these messages from people who really resonated. And it really just grew from there. Right, so it's not like you said, oh, I'm you made a plan and you said, okay, I'm going to uh, reach these kind of people and I'm gonna have certain people answers. No, you just said, okay, 
because it takes a lot to actually recognize it and to tell it to the world openly and right. I think like the fact of hiding it can have very bad um, consequences on people's relationships work self-esteem right. and moral moreover tell us about that please so I don't think that public disclosure is for everyone uh, for me it felt right because this was kind of my field and I already have had interest in there you know I have been I've had people plaster herpes on my face in Photoshop. I've had some really negative commentary on some message boards. I've had someone, I had to lock my LinkedIn because someone wrote a really hateful blog about me and found all this information. Um, but I do, I do find that, you know, disclosing to people that matter to you is helpful just to know that you have support and someone to turn to. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's really important. Um, I wouldn't know where I would be without my friends because they were the ones that really knew and supported me through that time. Although my ways of coping were not the health, the healthiest, um, I turned to alcohol and I didn't think that a therapist would understand me or what I was going through. I thought about it. I'm like, I should really see a therapist for this. And I just turned a blind eye. And now I am in a program training to be a clinical sex therapist and sexologist and hoping to be that person that I didn't have. Right. How important, right, to accept it and to actually look for help. So tell me about your book. You started writing for your blog and then right. your work started to grow. Like you plant your seed there. Then yeah. you have, uh, you wrote your book, Resilient Resources. How was right. your experience writing, editing, and publishing it? And also, how was the feedback from the public? Sure. I want to talk a bit about the title uh, because one of the messages that I commonly receive from people is that I'm so brave and that what I'm doing is brave work um, and that they wish they could be just as courageous as me. And so brave is never a word really fit with me. And it came about... Uh, I started doing a little bit digging and like, what what is this word that fits me? What is this word that fits what I'm doing? Because as we discussed, you know, as guys are really common, it's just the fact that people aren't talking about them or communicating about them uh, in these public venues or even as sexual health educators, therapists and counselors. So I like the word resilience because it's something that's attainable to everyone. And it's something that you, you bounce back. It's the ability to bounce back from trauma or adversity uh, or something negative that happens in your life that affects you. And so I want people and I want my readers, followers and community to realize that this is acceptable and that it is accessible to them. So that was really the title reasoning for that. Um, and it's really a collection of my diagnosis to tools to help how to, you know, it's only my experience that it, 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 it acknowledges that, you know, I'm a white heterosexual woman um, you know, I, I don't have the same experiences as a Latina woman or a black woman or a person of color. And I think that's really important to put that out there. Um, you know, I've seen this community grow and we all we often whitewash it. You know, we try to monetize our experiences and I don't want it to be that. But what I do want it to be is a resource that's more than, you know, the guidelines that they give you at the doctor's office or a pamphlet or something that you Google online. Um, and so there's a language guide. There's my feelings about my diagnosis, you know, dating, love and heartbreak um, resources, you know, how to pick yourself back up. And it's really important for me to bring myself back to those moments because now my work is really academic and I'm really focused on shifting the language and the narratives that we use to discuss STIs. So to sit back with my feelings and writing that and collecting those together was really emotional. I bet. And I think that the process might be very long because it takes you time to accept, it takes you time to absorb it, and then you have to get educated and say, okay, what is it? Do I contage? Right. How do I do? How do I say it? When do I say it? And I think after you do all that, you also have to, you know, like, work with people's reaction, partner's reactions. Right. And so it's a- Partners, it's a, family members. Exactly. It's a, a long, long process. And on that sense, tell us about your work as a consultant and as, as a speaker. What are the topics you sure. focus on? Sure. So I actually just started my own business established officially this year, which was really exciting for me. Congratulations. Um, because I had 
thank you because I have been writing so long and I really wanted to make this, I want to make it a move towards you know, one day opening my own practice. And I thought this was a really important step. I speak to high school and college age students and even sex educators uh, about destigmatizing STIs, the narratives that we use, how to shift our language to a more accepting tone and really what sex ed didn't teach you. It's the sex ed you never had. You know, how, how common is it to get an STI? Kind of the questions that you're asking, you know, what if you do, if you have one? How do you tell someone? How do you support a friend, a family member, yourself, uh, and really provide those resources? Because you know, there's they're hidden in the depths of the internet, and the internet, as we all know, can either be a friend or a foe. And exactly. I want to make these things more accessible to folks. So that's the premise of that work. Right, and like, just make it. I know it's a deep. Um, as we were saying, it's a long process, and it's a very deep topic like emotions feelings physically you go right. through a lot but all connected exactly but if we very fast we'll have to say like give like i don't know like three or four advices let's say whether you have a person you love that you know um, carries one of these diseases or is it yourself what are the sure. things you will tell them i would Tell them to sit, sit with their, if it's someone that's diagnosed, I'd say sit with your feelings um, because burying them as we kind of discussed can lead to a really dark hole. And I think it is important to let yourself cry and emote if you feel that way. Uh, what I do think it's important to also do is to not live there. So, you know, it's okay to have these moments or these days where you feel like your world is ending. But if you're having moments where you feel like you need to live there, I think it's time to connect, uh, connect with your friend, connect with your family, connect with the therapist, someone that can support you. And if you don't feel ready to connect, um, journal, find something that makes you safe and, you know, create a safe space in your home. A lot of these can be very painful depending on, um, the location or where it is, not only mentally, but physically. Um, so create a space that you want to come home to and that makes you feel safe and loved. You know, if it's a big fluffy pillow or candles or a nice bath, things like that. To friends, I would say be very careful um, and really honor the space if someone shares this with you because no, it, it took them a lot and it's not easy. Um, the best thing that you can probably say is I'm, I'm here for you. You know what? Allow them space to speak. If they need to cry, let them cry. You know, if they want to hug, let them hug, hug you. Um, and really be careful with how you phrase things too. You know, don't, don't say, well, who gave this to you? Because that just shifts the blame. And that's not really, you know, it could be an accident. It could be someone that doesn't know they have it. Exactly. And shifting that blame really isn't going to heal within. Um, you know, don't say things like I shared with you, you know, don't say like, well, were you wearing a condom? Because that's very shaming and blaming. And a lot of the language that we use and that we learn around STIs enforces that. So really be cognizant and kind of wait, you know, why am I talking? Like wait six seconds and just think. So Emily, thank you so much for what you do and for taking the time to be here today. I'll give you space. Please share all your social media information so people can find you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fabiana. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at sex education. So S E X E L D U C A T I O N. And my web address is emilydepass.com. All right, Emily, much success. Mwah. Continue with your beautiful work, helping people and doing your awesome writing. And until next time with me, be well. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiana. On one hand, there is still a lot to absorb and learn about this topic. On the other, there is no more time to waste suffering for it or hating it. Self-acceptance, inclusion, and sex education are definitely topics that need to be approached from a loving, caring, and compassionate point of view. To connect with me, write to conectadosbolivia24 at gmail.com or send me a private message on my Facebook page. Stay connected and until next time with me, bye-bye.